The purpose of this video will be to cover the basic requirements for the response paper assignment, tell you a little bit about what you should expect to do in this assignment, and also how you'll be evaluated. So first, you can see here we are on the Moodle page for our course, and the go-to area to find information about this assignment would be in the general course information and resources area. And if we scroll down, we can find in the area where you find the syllabus and the exam study guides, there's a document called response paper guidelines. And this is the document that will have all the information that you need about the response paper assignment. And it's the one I'm gonna go through currently. Okay, so we should begin by saying just a few things about what is the purpose of this assignment, what is its point, what are you um, supposed to get out of it from a philosophical point of view. So the purpose of the assignment is just to help you to practice some core philosophical skills. And those core philosophical skills are how to read a text of philosophical writing closely, and then also engage in criticism of the argument contained in that text. So as I'll show you shortly, there is going to be a certain, um, a certain prompt that you will respond to for each paper. That prompt will identify an area of text which you'll be required to focus on. You will be required to explain in your own words in a way that shows your understanding the argument of that section of text and then criticize or argue against it. Now one thing you might say at the outset is, well, why am I being required to criticize the argument or argue against uh, the author? Perhaps it's the case that I agree with the point the author is making. Maybe I think it's a good argument. And that's totally fair. That's fine. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that this is a, an academic or learning exercise. So I don't even necessarily assume that um, what you write for your response paper assignments is necessarily your actual beliefs. It's actually it's completely irrelevant to me what you actually believe. The purpose of the assignment is different. It's just to help you practice engaging with argument. And the best way to really practice engaging with an argument is to think about its flaws. And this even goes for arguments that you agree with or think are good, right? And in turn, this can be helpful because if there's some argument for a position that you think is really good, but you say to yourself, okay, although I'm inclined to believe this, um, what are some potential problems with it? Well, that can do a couple things for you. It can help you better understand the other side, those who would disagree with you, and also help you anticipate ways that um, you might respond to criticisms of the argument. So overall, because I really want this paper to be a demonstration of your critical and philosophical thinking, that's going to be much easier to show if you are taking a critical stance toward the argument, instead of it, rather if you're just agreeing with everything the author says. So in general, you're going to be required to criticize the argument. Okay, so that's the basic purpose of the assignment. Let's get down to some of the nuts and bolts items um, just about the basic requirements. So first, throughout the semester, you will be required to complete four response paper assignments. And now, as you saw in my video on the syllabus, um, each of these response papers is worth 50 points. There's four of them, so that's 200 total points. That's 25% of your grade total. So the first question is, is okay, well, how do I know um, when these papers are due? And there's a couple ways that you can uh, gain that information. So one, let's go back to Moodle, and let's take a look at the syllabus and go to the course schedule. So in week one, we don't have any response papers due. Let's scroll down to week two. Week two is when we have our first response paper due. And you can see here it's due on September 13th at the end of the day. So one place you can see when the response papers are due, uh, uh, all four of them, is directly from the syllabus. A second way in which you can see when the response papers are due is going back to the response paper document. Let's go up to the table of contents, and if you look at section five, response paper assignment descriptions, there's an area for each response paper, so let's just click on response paper one. And you will see here that in each area describing each response paper assignment, it will also have the due date, right? So on response paper one is due Sunday, September 13th at the end of the day. Response paper two, is Sunday, September 20th at the end of the day, et cetera, et cetera. So that is when you can find out uh, when the papers are due. Okay, now, like I said, there are four of those due. You'll be required to complete all four of them. And we should also say a few things about how long the assignment is required to be. 
Oh, actually, no, sorry, before I get there, also I wanted to show you where you turn these in. Um, so the area you turn them in is in the area for that week in which it's due. So we said the first response paper, response paper one is due in week two. So let's go to the week two area of the course. And we scroll down. And here's response paper one. So you can also see that the prompt for response paper one is listed here. You can also find that on the response paper document. But in any case, if you click this link, it'll take you to an area where you'll have to upload a, a, um, a Word document or a PDF, a submission of your paper. Okay, so you'll, you'll find all those links in the corresponding area of the relevant week of the course. So, okay, now let's say a few things about the length and format of the assignment. So the, um, the length requirement is that the paper must be at least 600 words. Um, that's a basement or a floor. There is no ceiling. So... Um, you know, the paper can be as long as you want. Now, if you went on for thousands and thousands of words, it's likely you would be rambling, the paper would be difficult to understand, um, and for that reason, you might get points taken off, but you wouldn't get points taken off merely because the paper is very long, right? So the paper has to be at least 600 words, but there is no upper limit, right? You're more than welcome, and for many papers, it'll probably be necessary to go above 600 words. Now, what does that 600 words include? It includes just all written actual text of your paper. So it doesn't include like your name or the title or the section headings or anything in the bibliography. Um, and to see this also, we should see that the paper is divided into three sections. So you can see here, I've said the entire paper is at least 600 words. And the way it's divided is an explanation section, an analysis section, and a bibliography section. And in fact, the very first thing that I would do um, if I was writing this assignment is I would pull up a Word document and before I got going with even thinking about the prompt or with thinking about anything else, um, before I did that, I would actually write out those section headings. These, they should appear just like this on your paper. So one, explanation, two, analysis, three, bibliography. And I am sort of a stickler on the section headings, right? If you don't have them, that will be some points off on your paper. And you might wonder why that is, why does it matter? Two main reasons. One, it makes it a lot easier to grade for me. I can locate each part of your paper um, much more easily. And two, it will help you to be more systematic um, and more organized in the way you write the paper. So that should really be the first thing you do. And if you want, you can be free to put on a uh, put a title on your paper, and your name can always be helpful. So you might say something like, an, uh, <laughs> Once we start reading Plato's Apology, this, this title will make a little more sense, but uh, you know, I'll just title this um, paper Philosophy Worth Dying For and Ryan Pollock. Okay, so like I said, that title might seem strange. It'll make more sense when we get into the material and Plato's Apology, but I might set the paper up like this and it should be formatted in that way, most importantly, with these section headings. Okay. Um, so let's say a few things about each of the sections. So and I'll, say, I'll start off by saying a few things about the bibliography. So the bibliography section is meant to contain all the sources that you cite in your paper. Now this brings up a couple of questions. So one, um, what are, are you required to cite any sources? And yes, the answer is you're required to cite at least one source, and that one source you're required to cite is the reading you are writing about. So the bibliographic information for that reading should go in your bibliography section. Now you might say, well, we don't have a textbook. Um, all the readings are uploaded online. I don't know what the bibliographic information is. How do I find that? Excellent question. So if we go back up to the table of contents and for this document, and we go to bibliography, um, and for this paper, I'm just imagining that I'm writing it on uh, Plato's Apology. So I scroll down, Plato, Apology, I can just copy that, and I can paste it right here. So that part of the document that you just looked at, um, as a matter of fact, has all the bibliographic information, uh, has all the bibliographic information for every single reading that we will complete in this class. So any or any reading that you can write a response paper on. So any paper you're writing on for your response paper, you should be able to find the bibliographic information here. Simply copy and paste it and that will be fine. Now the second question is, uh, okay, so let's say um, 
we have to at least cite the reading we're writing about. Are we permitted to use any other sources in the paper? And the answer is yes. And I'll have a few more things to say about other sources later on, but you can use other sources. You're not required to. In fact, um, it may could be helpful sometimes, but it might not also be helpful. Many of the best papers just really focus in detail on the reading and don't get caught up in trying to cite a lot of other things. But it could be helpful in some cases, and you're certainly allowed to do that. But if you do cite other sources, then those should be, um, the bibliographic information should be in your bibliography as well. And if you want to see examples of how to cite those, um, how to cite other sources, then you can also go to the bibli bibliography section. And here I just have some sample citations, citations for like an academic journal article, a book chapter, uh, an entire book, right? So just follow those formats, and that is how you can cite other sources. Okay, um, so yeah, that is what I want to say for the moment about the bibliography. So what about the other two sections? These are, of course, the more important sections of your paper where the actual argumentation and writing will be done, and that's the explanation and analysis section. So I'm going to go through these in a little more detail in a second, but just in general, the explanation section of your paper is a section of, of your paper where you are simply explaining the argument of the author that you are writing about, the one that the prompt is directing you to write about. So all you're doing there is explaining. In the analysis section, on the other hand, that is where you're making your philosophical criticism of the argument. And while the paper as a whole has to be 600 words, the explanation and analysis sections also have their own individual word requirements. So the explanation section itself must be at least 200 words, and the analysis section must be at least 200 words. I just have this in place so we have some level of parity. So for instance, you don't spend 600 words um, explaining the argument and then spend like one sentence in philosophical criticism. I want both sections to receive you know, roughly equal attention. Okay, so that's basic points about the length and format. Now, let's say a few more things about the um, most important sections of the paper itself, the explanation section and the analysis section. Let's start with the explanation section. Like I said, in this section, all you're doing is explaining the argument you're writing about. And here it can be helpful to look at an example of a prompt for one of the, uh, for one of the papers. So as you'll see here, I have an example of one of the prompts from response paper two. And this is essay prompt one. Now you notice here I only actually have one of the essay prompts. So I think it's actually worth looking at response paper two description on the document itself. So if we go back up here to the response paper assignment descriptions, click on response paper two. You notice that there's essay prompt one, the one I had an example of um, up above, but there's also others. Here's essay prompt two and essay prompt three. So let's say you get to response paper two and you say, oh, do I have to respond to all of these? And the answer is no, you choose just one essay prompt. So you either respond to essay prompt one or two or three, you can choose. Now you notice that response paper one, for instance, is not like that. There's just one essay prompt, so that's your only option. But I believe uh, response papers two, three, and four all have multiple options. And so you get to choose which of those prompts you're responding to. But just for our example, Let's say you are doing response paper two and you're doing essay prompt one. Let's just read through the prompt a little bit to um, let you know sort of what I'm thinking and how I'm intending the prompt to be helpful. So essay prompt one says that 28B Socrates imagines that someone has asked him the following question, but perhaps someone may say, aren't you ashamed Socrates to have engaged in the sort of occupation philosophy that has now put you at risk of death? In response, Socrates claims, and I have a quote from the reading, given this, Socrates argues on pages 32 to 35 that there is nothing shameful about his practice of philosophy, even though it has put him at risk of death. Explain the argument Socrates makes here. Why has this practice of philosophy put him in danger? Why does he believe someone must never do anything that's unjust? Why would it be unjust of Socrates to stop practice, practicing philosophy? Then in your analysis section, criticize Socrates' argument. So there's a couple of important elements here. I have a little introduction to the topic, um, explaining to you the basic topic you should write about. But then importantly, I've also detailed the pages on which the relevant argument occurs. So when it says Socrates argues on pages 32 to 35 that there's nothing shameful about his practice of philosophy, 
what I'm telling you is here's where the main portion of the argument occurs and you should be primarily focusing your attention on what he's saying in those pages. This doesn't mean that uh, what it, the other parts of the reading or, or what he says elsewhere isn't important. It will be important for context. But the main focus of your paper should be on the argument that he makes there. And what you'll want to do in your explanation section is explain in as much detail and as clear and formulated a fashion as possible how he is reasoning there, how he gets to the conclusion that there's nothing shameful about his practice of philosophy, which has put him in danger of, of dying. You'll notice also I have, I have some questions to think about. I say, why is this practice of philosophy put him in danger, etc. There's like three different questions here. Um, in the other prompts, there may be more questions. So one thing you might say is, well, do I have to like respond to each of those questions just as they're written in that order? Is that what you're looking for? And the answer is no. I'm really just providing you those questions to point you in the right direction, to get you um, to help you start thinking about what to write. But you shouldn't feel like you have to respond to all those questions. It's really just an aid to you. So the prompt says, here is the portion of text you have to write about. Explain the argument he makes there, and then your, in your analysis section, criticize it. Okay, so that's basically what the analysis section is about. But um, to help you out a little more, and one thing I'll say is, the best way to get to improve at this is just going to be to start doing it, right? I can explain to you in a general way how to read philosophical writing, uh, the questions to ask yourself when you're reading philosophy, and how to criticize a philosophical argument. But the best way to really learn how to do it is just, just to get practice. And that's really what these assignments are designed to do. So it very well might be the case that the grade you receive on your first response paper isn't necessarily what you would want it to be, but you should take that just as this is an opportunity for you to improve. And in fact, one thing I'll look for when I'm thinking about um, uh, possibly bumping up grades at the end of the semester, in addition to looking at your participation in the discussion boards, one thing I also look at, was there consistent improvement on the response papers? So if you didn't do so well in the first one, but you worked hard, you showed um, that you were taking in my feedback and making improvements to your uh, subsequent papers, then certainly I would take that into account, and this can be a reason for bumping your grade up at the end of the semester. Okay, but in general, to, to give you a little more guidance, when explaining a philosopher's argument, there are really three questions that you should ask, and your reader should be able to give an answer to these three questions after they've read your explanation section. Now, one thing I'll say is, if you have not um, watched the video on logic and structure of argument, which is uh, uh, lecture two, I would actually recommend you stop right now and go watch that video first, because I'm going to be appealing to some concepts like premise and conclusion, which won't make sense to you unless you've watched that video. Okay, so, but there are these three questions, and the way I think about these questions is the following. So the first question you should ask yourself when you are explaining a philosophical argument is, what is the author arguing for? What is the conclusion? Okay, now, and in fact, right, so first of all, I would say you don't, you shouldn't feel like you have to have this exact sentence. You have to plagiarize the exact sentence I'm writing right now. But the best papers will have some sort of sentence of the following kind. They might start off their explanation by saying, uh, for instance, in the Apology, Uh, Socrates argues that his practice of philosophy is not shameful even though it has led to his death. Okay, so if you have a sentence like uh, of this sort, this is a very effective sentence because right up front it tells the reader here is what, here's the conclusion that the author is arguing for. Socrates is uh, it, as you'll see when we get to the Apology, is trying to convince the jury that he knows that even though his practice of philosophy is what has will ultimately cause him to die and be executed by the city of Athens, even though that's the case, he thinks there's nothing shameful about him practicing philosophy. So in this way, the reader knows up front exactly what the author's arguing for, and now you're set up to explain what are the reasons he gives for this. Now, if you remember from that video on logic and the structure of argument, we said premises are the reasons in an argument given for a conclusion. So once you've identified the specific conclusion, then you can say, okay, what are the fundamental claims the author uses to establish the, the conclusion? What are the premises 
that lead to that conclusion. And so you want to think to yourself, okay, what are the main pieces of evidence, the main reason that Socrates or whoever the author is is giving for why that conclusion is true? That's your next step. Now, one thing that might be brought up here is you say, well, um, you know, in many of your lectures, you outline arguments in standard form where we have premise one, premise two, premise three, conclusion, etc. Do I have to do that in my paper? For instance, once I've outlined, identified the conclusion, at some point, do I have to do something like this? Okay, here's premise one of the argument and fill it in. Here's premise two. Here's premise three and conclusion. Do I have to have some format like this in my paper? And my answer would be you certainly can, right? If you find it helpful, I often do find it helpful to outline arguments in this format. And if you find it helpful, um, then certainly that's something you could do. You could introduce a conclusion, say here is the basic reasoning, and then go through explain each premise. But oftentimes um, when students attempt to do this, it causes sort of more trouble or problems or maybe anxiety than it's worth. You're wondering, well, did I outline the argument exactly right? Are these really the three exact premises, right? So if it's not useful to you, don't feel like you have to do this. If you just want to talk in a more, um, you know, just explain in more like paragraph form, here are the reasons that the author gives for the conclusion, that's perfectly fine. What really matters is that in your explanation section, you've identified the conclusion and you've identified the fundamental reasons the author gives for that conclusion. Okay, now what's the third question? The third question is, what reason does the author give to think that the premises are true? So the author is saying, here are the reasons why the conclusion is true. Well, why should we think these premises are true? And here I want to make a point about what you often find in philosophical argument. I wouldn't say this about all philosophical arguments, but in many philosophical arguments, you'll see that sometimes it's really only one or two premises that are really at issue. There might be some premises in the argument which pretty much anyone would accept. They're non-controversial, right? They're pretty objective and obvious. But there might be one or two premises that are more controversial that many people would disagree with. And if there are a few premises that many people would disagree with, then it's very likely that those are the premises that the author needs to spend the most time explaining and defending. And likewise, in your explanation section, you should spend the most time explaining um, how the author argues for those premises. So let's say in your argument you think that, well, you know, P3 is pretty obvious, but P1 and P2, those are the ones that need the most explanation. Well, then you might spend the most time explaining how Socrates argues for the first premise, the most time explaining how Socrates argues for the second premise, right? And you can even do this in a very systematic way, right? You have this argument outline maybe, or at least you've identified the major re reason. And then you can say, well, you know, Socrates' argument for P1 is, and you can go ahead and explain in a clear and detailed fashion how he argues for that claim. And then maybe in the second separate paragraph, you say Socrates', Socrates argument for P2 is, and again, you don't have to say it in exactly this fashion. In fact, just saying it that way is sort of repetitive and dull, but you get the idea. If you have uh, specific portions of your explanation section um, assigned to explaining each of the premises, especially in the most controversial ones, then the reader will get a full picture of how it is that the author is arguing for his or her conclusion. Okay, so. Th that's sort of an outline of how you explain a philosophical argument. These are, in fact, the questions I ask myself whenever I'm putting together a lesson to explain a an argument. But at the end of the day, what I'm really looking for is what I would call a complete explanation. So after you've done a first draft of your paper, read it again and ask yourself the following question. Have I completely explained the argument in a way that would satisfy the following definition? So completely explaining a philosophical argument requires explaining everything an intelligent person who is unacquainted with philosophy, this class, or the argument you're writing about would need to fully understand the argument. So if you imagine you have a really intelligent roommate, but just who has never encountered philosophy or this class, you want to imagine that they could read your paper and fully understand the argument that the author is making. If you've done that, then you have fully done your job. Okay, so once you have completed the explanation section, then you can move on to the analysis section. And if you have a systematic outline or um, systematic understanding of the argument, your analysis section becomes much easier because remember, the purpose of the analysis section is to criticize the argument. 
And if all of the premises of the argument are needed to establish the conclusion, then technically you only need to criticize one of the premises. You can criticize more than one premise if you would like. The only thing I would caution is sometimes when students do that, it leads to writing in a more superficial way instead of talking in detail about just one big important idea or one premise. Um, what will happen is a student will talk at a surface level, um, at more of a surface level about a larger number of things. But it's always better to be deeper and more detailed about a smaller number of topics than, than sh more shallow and less detailed about a larger number of topics. So let's say in this particular case you have an outline of the argument and you say, okay, the premise I want to argue against is P1. Then you can have this sentence in your paper, something like it again, that really lets me know that you have a fundamental systematic understanding of your paper. So if you begin your analysis section with a sentence like, um, I reject uh, Socrates' argument, or I think Socrates' argument is unsound, because P1 is false, the problem with P1 is ex whatever, and then you go on to explain it. If you clearly identify what aspect of the argument you are rejecting in the analysis section, then that shows me you really um, are thinking in a clear and systematic fashion. That's a very good thing. And then the rest of your analysis section would be spent explaining what you think is wrong with premise one. Now again, I can't say too much about how to do that here because really, again, the best way to understand how to criticize philosophical arguments is to pay attention to the lectures, pay attention to the reading, and just practice and do it and take my feedback and try to improve. But in general, what you want to do in the analysis section is explain as detailed a fashion as you can why one or more of the premises of the argument are incorrect or false. Um, okay, so... Um, in terms of the basic content of the paper, those are the major guidelines there. So I'll say a few other things about citation. So in this paper, not only are you required to have a bibliography, which lists all the sources, but also you're required to have in-text citations. And the way this should happen is with author last name and the page number. Now, when do you have to use a citation? So here's the rule. You have to use a citation whenever you attribute any claim to an author. And that's even if that is if you're not citing a direct quote. In fact, that's because for this assignment, direct quotes are not allowed. So what do I mean by that? So what, what I mean when I say direct quotes are not allowed is that you should never have a sentence like this in your paper. Uh, Socrates states that an unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. Uh, and then you would put Plato, page 15, because although Socrates is the main character in the dialogue, as we'll see, the dialogue is actually written by Plato. So what do we have here? This is a direct quote, an actual quote from the reading, and you've cited the author and the page number. This part is perfectly fine, but what's not okay is that we have this aspect right here, which is a direct quote. And the reason I'm not allowing any direct quotes in this assignment is because it's a very short assignment. I really don't want it to be taken up. Um, with direct quotes from the reading, I want you to demonstrate your understanding of what's being said by putting the claims being made in your own words, which means you, you'll be paraphrasing. So instead, you might say, uh, Socrates believes that any human being who fails to live an examined life and engage in critical questioning of their critical questioning of their beliefs is not living a life that um, we'll say is worthy of our status as human beings. Okay, so this is one paraphrase I just kind of made up on, on the fly, but the basic idea here is you've taken this idea that you're saying Plato said on page uh, 15, that an unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. And you're putting in your own words. What does that mean, an unexamined life is not worth living? Well, it means that we should be critically questioning our beliefs, asking if they're true, challenging ourselves to pursue the truth. And if we're not doing that, then the way we're living is not really worthy of a human being. It's, it's not worthy of our status, our higher status as human beings. So this is a paraphrase of what Socrates is saying. And so a couple of things here. You've attempted to explain Socrates' point in your own words. Um, 
And so it's not a direct quote, but you still need a citation here. So the reason for that is because if Socrates says this thing about an unexamined life, then there must be some page on which Socrates says it. And if there is that page, you have to demonstrate that you know where that page is. This is just a fundamental aspect of academic discourse. If you're going to say attribute a claim to someone, you better demonstrate and provide evidence that they actually hold that thing or they actually said it. And so that's what we're doing here. So your paper should have in-text citations every time you are saying that the author believes, states, claims, asserts, whatever. Anything like that needs an in-text an in citation. And what I'm really looking for with the paraphrasing is not that you just sort of say almost the same thing but in slightly different words, but you're really expanding on it. Um, maybe you're using your own examples, explaining in your own way. Using a paraphrase that really um, demonstrates a more fundamental understanding of the, the quote that you're paraphrasing. Notice what I did here, it says not worth living for a human being. Well, what does that mean? Well, one way of thinking about that is when Socrates says an unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being, he thinks there's a certain status human beings have. And if we don't live up to that status, or we, we can only live up to that status by examining our lives. So I've sort of taken this idea and drawn that further out the implication, and that shows a deeper understanding of the text. And that's really what I'm looking for in your paraphrases. Not just sort of more or less the exact direct quotes with some words changed and, and but no quotation marks. Okay, um, so I'll just say a word about plagiarism. I definitely look for plagiarism um, and I take it seriously and any assignment that is plagiarized will receive a zero. And one other point I want to make is that a point about proper and improper sources. So there are certain sources you should not use. If you want, like I said, you don't have to use any additional sources other than the reading. But if, if you do, they should be peer-reviewed academic sources. So things like Wikipedia or blogs or online notes posted by other professors just wouldn't qualify. They're not peer-reviewed and academic. But if you are looking for uh, additional sources, two resources I would recommend would be the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Each of these contains many pages on a multitude of philosophical topics, and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy in particular is aimed more at, at beginners. And so all of that is peer-reviewed, and that, I would suggest that is a great place to start. Um, okay, so we already went over the bibliography. Finally, just a point about grading. So, so I'm not really going to go over all these points because basically I went over them already in explaining the assignment, but just to break down how the grading will occur. So the assignments were 50 points, um, 20 points is basic requirement. So that's stuff like, do you have in text citations? Do you have se section headings? Is the paper submitted on time? If you can answer yes to all these basic questions, then you should get that 20 points. And that should be easy um, because it really requires no philosophical skill or understanding. It just requires following the rules. After that, then your explanation and analysis section will each be worth 15 points. And they'll be grading on the following scale. So excellent work is 15 out of 15, good is 12, average is 7, etc., etc. I could grade in between that as well, but that just gives you a basic overview. And again, um, the way to think about this is for excellent work, I really do mean, so to get a 15 out of 15, it really would be work that goes above and beyond, that truly is striving after excellence. And that would be something uh, rare that you'd have to work toward and really improve your skills to be able to achieve. So the way I would really encourage you to think about this assignment is that you should be seeking to show improvement. You shouldn't expect to get um, 100% on the first paper. Um, you should expect that this will be, you have to take some time to think about how you can improve on the response papers each week that you do them. Uh, okay, so I think that's everything I want to say about this assignment. If anything is unclear, please do uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to uh, do my best to clarify anything for you. Uh, so in any case, I'll cut it there and I will see you in the next video.